in order to be a good manager in the 2020s, you need to be an empathetic human and you need to be able to, to tune, in, tune in on how other people on your team are feeling, not just down below you, but also on the same level as you and above you and, and be able to, to demonstrate some good emotional intelligence so that you can pivot and meet people where they're at. And then the second thing I would suggest is you have to shift your mindset. You have to do some, do some deliberate thinking about, okay, I was a great engineer or I was a great financial analyst and I was paid for doing tasks. Now I'm paid for getting results through other people and motivating other people. It's an entirely different skill set, and that's where I see a lot of people get hung up. Hello, and welcome to the Making Better podcast, where we talk about how to make better, whether that is better selves, better teams, or better organizations. If you are a business owner, a learning and development professional, a manager, or even an individual contributor in your organization, this show will give you actionable insights to help improve your own performance and the performance of those around you. Our guest today is Eric Girard. Eric has over 30 years of experience helping improve the performance of managers and employees. He specializes in the development of new managers, focusing on their successful transition to their new role and on their team management skills using his high energy and engaging facilitation style. Eric is a passionate, lifelong learner. As a Paddy Open Water Scuba instructor, he is pursuing the rating of Master Scuba Diver Trainer. When not designing or delivering training, he enjoys spending time outdoors with his wife and twin 14-year-old daughters. Before we get into the discussion with Eric, I need to remind you, everyone, if you're new to the show, uh, please make sure you subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And if you're already subscribed, I would ask that you share this show with at least one other person because that, after all, is how we grow, and I can't tell you how much it means to me. With that, let's get started Eric, how are you doing today? I am good. I'm glad it's Friday. I'll tell you that. Yes, absolutely. Me too. Um, I'm I'm really excited to have this discussion. You and I have gotten to know each other over the past couple months as members of the talent development think tank community. I've really enjoyed our conversations. And so uh, the first question I have for you is, of course, what is the best place you have ever dived? The best place I've ever dived? I'd say Fiji. Fiji was, was off the hook. Yeah, okay. pretty amazing. Yeah, and a second like a, a, a second to that would be Kauai. Um, and, and the reason why those two places is because those are the two places my wife and I went on our honeymoon. And I got okay. her certified to dive, and we went together, and it was amazing. That's awesome. Amazingly enough, I have only dove in two places in the world, and one of them is also Kauai. I really, I really enjoyed it. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love it. So I find I always find it interesting when people have in the training space are not just kind of you know more traditional L and D professionals, but they're doing training out in some other fashion, right? I would imagine there's a lot of, do you, I guess I'll just ask the question, do you draw a lot from kind of your work as a scuba instructor and see that that is influencing how you instruct in the classroom? You know, they, they play together. So management development and scuba do play together because a lot of what I know about adult learning theory in my day job translates to how I teach scuba. You know, so so explaining the big picture, explaining the why and the with them, what's in it for me before getting into a detailed concept and, and helping folks understand, OK, this way is north. This is why we're here. This is why I should care sort of a thing, because you, you have to learn a lot of kind of obscure skills in scuba. Yeah. Just in case, just in case, in case something goes wrong. And, you know, in the middle of the instruction, it's easy for folks to kind of get lost in all of that. Like, why are we doing this? What is all of that? So constantly explaining, hey, this is why this matters to you. This is the benefit of learning this. And that that translates between management development and scuba. And then something that I've, I've taken from scuba is the way that PADI, the Professional Association of Diving Instructors, structures their courses. It's all really well done, excellent instructional design. They start from conceptual, theoretical, academic, where you, you take an online course developed in Articulate Rise, by the way. So you start, <laughs> you start nice. with an online course where you get exposed to the theory and the concepts. Then you come to a classroom and discuss that and take a quick quiz and cement your knowledge. 
And then you head out to the pool where you first learn about the gear and how to put it together. And then you get in the shallow end. And the first breath you take underwater isn't in the ocean. It's just bending over and putting your face in the water in the shallow end. And so just, just scaffolding, little tiny steps, little scaffolds. Yes. Works really well in scuba to get people ready for that dive in the ocean. But you don't just throw people in the ocean. And so I, I often remember that when I'm teaching management development is let's not throw people in the ocean. You know, let's start small and work up to the bigger concept. Absolutely. And that's that's why I think it's so interesting and great when people do have some of those other kinds of instruction in their lives. Because, you know, I certainly think about this from my career teaching people how to fly planes. It's just all the concepts that we talk about in talent development and learning development, like you mentioned, scaffolding. Um, it's they just become so much more real when you're out in the in in a very practical setting of teaching somebody how to dive. It's not just you, you can literally see people going through those stages of of development um, in really clear ways, which is sometimes sometimes can be harder in more traditional corporate training. I would say. Yeah, one of the things I always do in every class I design and teach is that there's always play time. There's always time to try a concept. You know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to teach coaching and I'm going to teach a grow model, not only am I going to explain it and discuss it and answer questions, but you're going to conduct a mini coaching session and get feedback on that. Um, same, same with scuba. You know, I'm going to explain a concept. I'm going to explain why you should care. And then you're going to go do it and come back and we're, we're going to talk about it. So... It does. There's a lot of crossover. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you got into leadership training and kind of training in general, correct me if I'm wrong, but you kind of grew up in your career in Silicon Valley, kind of as, as I would say, you know, technology was kind of eating the world, <laughs> right? Or software was like these companies were just growing phenomenally fast. Um, and I think there's some interesting things that happen at these companies. One, because of the way they're run and kind of then the, the pace at which they grow. How did your time, you know, kind of learning to do this in Silicon Valley affect how you view uh, management and then management training? My first job in Silicon Valley started in December 1999 at a company called Veritas. And that was right at the top of the dot-com bubble. Yeah. So it, it, <laughs> it burst not long after that. It burst like the spring of 2000 or something. Yeah. And everything was on fire. We, and uh, my job was to run the new hire workshop to, to bring on new hires. We were hiring something like 60 people a month or something like that. It was just, it was a lot. And my manager, my first manager was an amazing guy who was just amazingly empathetic and really good at getting the team together and, and getting us all pointed in the, in the same place. And um, was also my first remote manager. So he, he sat in San Luis Obispo, California. I sat in Mountain View, California, and we were on the phone multiple times a day, just checking in, how's it going? Got any questions? Yeah. What do you need? And it just, it, it was a great introduction to management. So Brent figures prominently in my book. Um, I talk a lot about him as a positive example of, of how, to, how to do management. He's been on my podcast. He's mentioned in the book. He, uh, he, we still stay in touch. We, we talk often throughout the year. So that was a great positive example. And then as I continued through my time in Silicon Valley, I ran into folks who, for example, used to be my peers at an acquiring company, and, and we were acquired by a, a company that was equal in size and equal in revenue. And somebody who had been my peer in the acquiring company was now suddenly my, my boss. Mm -hmm. Never received any training, just got the promotion. Of course. And it was horrible. It was just no fun. Um, I didn't like it. She didn't like it. Our team didn't like it. She actually voluntarily stepped out of that role. But wow. not before she made a bunch of mistakes and made our lives miserable. So I definitely experienced both sides of the coin on great managers and not so great managers. And, you know, that kind of informed, you know, years later, that informed a lot of the premise of the book. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. I think that, that tie in of, or sometimes those, those bad examples are really what are more informative sometimes than the good examples for sure. Um, anything about kind of that, 
fast paced environment. I mean, I know you focus a lot on new managers and making that transition. I'm guessing that came out of part of that fact and that there's just a lot of new managers at especially growing companies. Yeah. There's always, always folks who are being promoted. There's always that, that high potential, high performing individual contributor who gets tapped by senior management or senior leaders like, okay, you are an awesome engineer. We're going to have you lead the engineers. And I think what's missing is that what got you here won't get you there to, to quote yes. Marshall Goldsmith. So, just because you're an amazing doer doesn't mean you're going to be an amazing leader. And if you're not prepared, you could really fail. And I saw that happen a lot, and it happened to me. Even though I should have known better, I got promoted to lead my team in another company, and I came in like a bull in a china shop and just wreaked havoc. And <laughs> none of us were happy. So, yeah. so I walked away from that thinking, okay, never again. That's never going to happen to me or anybody else ever again. I'm, I'm really going to be thoughtful and planful about how I develop myself, how I develop other managers, and ultimately it became, became this business. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned that you just came out with a book called Lead Like a Pro. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to get kind of a pre-read of it. I think it's really a really amazing book. I, I mean, I, gotta, I really have to compliment you on how well-researched I found it and how everything that you were saying is really grounded. You're really building on top of a lot of other work that's been done and then integrating it together really seamlessly to be these practical tips for people. Um, what are some of the hardest things? You know, you mentioned this, this transition. It's all about realizing what got you here won't get you there. What tend to be some of the biggest hangups that people have when they're making that transition into being a first-time manager that you've seen? Well, the first chapter of the book is all about bringing the empathy. I think, I think that, that in order to be a good manager in the 2020s, you need to be an empathetic human. And you need to be able to, to tune, in, tune in on how other people on your team are feeling, not just down below you, but also on the same level as you and above you, and, and be able to, to demonstrate some good emotional intelligence so that you can pivot and meet people where they're at. Because you never know what people are going through. Um, you know, Lord knows. If there's, uh, I read the New York Times every day, and I kind of wish I didn't because there's <laughs> just there's so much stuff going on in the world. And then people have stuff going on in their personal lives. And, oh, by the way, COVID's coming back. And, and, and. So being an empathetic person, I think, is a prerequisite these days for being a great manager. And then the second thing I would suggest is you have to shift your mindset. You have to do some, do some deliberate thinking about, okay, I was a great engineer or I was a great financial analyst and I was paid for doing tasks. Now I'm paid for getting results through other people and motivating other people. It's an entirely different skill set. And that's where I see a lot of people get hung up is they don't make that transition or they don't make it quickly. And so in the meantime, they micromanage. They don't set goals. Yep. They don't do the basic blocking and tackling that you need to do as a manager. And then they also hoard the tasks. They do the things that they were good at. They just hang on to it. They don't delegate that out, which causes huge bottlenecks and slows everybody down and causes problems on the team because people are like, excuse me, don't, don't you trust me? Like, I can do that. Let me, let me run. Yeah. So those are, those are some of the, the first two things that I would encourage a, a new manager to consider is ramp up the empathy and be deliberate about that transition. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, especially because of the way that we tend to promote people, like you said, because they were an excellent individual contributor, they were a great engineer. It's almost by definition then that you are going to be better at like individual tasks than the people who are on your team, at least initially, right? Like almost by definition, that's, that's what's naturally going to happen. And so I think that is why so many people fall into that trap of, but I could do this, this, this task, I could do it faster or I could do it better. And then it's such a good point that you're making though, is realizing that's not the job anymore, you know, of it really is something different now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and I've done this myself. I do it with my kids all the time. You know, for example, mowing the lawn. Yeah. I'll see, will you please mow the lawn? Okay. Here's how I want you to mow the lawn. No, I'll do it myself. I'll do it my way. No, 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 but my way is better. No, but I, Dad, I can do this. And so I've gotten into knockdown, drag out fights with my daughter over how the lawn's going to be mowed. You know, that's not good delegation. That's, that's not me 
uh, drinking my own champagne, as they say. Yeah. So, you know, if you're going to delegate to somebody, let them bring their own individual experience and, and mindset to it and let them surprise you. And yeah, it may take a while and they may have to do the task over twice. It, it may happen. It may go slower than you would like. But think of it as an investment. If I allow or enable this employee to take on this task of, you know, the new TPS cover, cover sheet or, or whatever, if, if, if I let you own that and you go through it, make a mistake, reflect on those mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and then do it again, now I've got somebody, now I have power because now I've duplicated myself. Exactly. And, you know, that person may get good enough that they can then train the people behind them and so on and so on. Yeah. And now you're not the bottleneck anymore. Really, yeah. really valuable. Yeah. And I think it's also another piece of that is realizing that just because it's not your way doesn't mean it's the wrong way. Like kind of opening your aperture of what's acceptable work a little bit so that um, people can explore their own way. And then maybe what they do will end up being a better way. Maybe the results will end up being better than what you had initially thought if you allow them that freedom. Um, do you think companies, you know, every company that I've ever worked at, I was never just a manager. I was always a manager with other individual contributor duties. Um, how do you think, like, is that part of the problem or is that just something that people need to figure out how to manage? That's just the way it is. And, you know, I've never met a manager who was just a professional manager. Maybe, maybe I've met one who was just a professional manager, but most managers I've encountered have some level of individual contributor tasks they're responsible for. And so that the challenge for those folks is to delegate as much as you can so that you can focus on those things only you can do. So, for example, with, with my company, with Gerard Training Solutions, when I started the company, I'm like, well, I'll be a one-man band. I will design, develop, and deliver the programs. I will take care of the branded slide decks. I will run the website. I will do the bookkeeping. I will do the marketing. And I got overwhelmed for one thing, so I was exhausted all the time. And secondly, I was really making a mess of things. It turns out I'm not really that good of a web designer, and I'm a yeah. horrible bookkeeper. And it cost me a yeah. thousand bucks to fix my mistakes at tax time. So yeah. you can make your life a lot easier if you just remember the mantra of, you know, what are the things that only I can do? And be really, really ruthless about that. Really? Are you really the only person who can do this? Or could somebody else take this on? And then your portfolio becomes more manageable and you empower the rest of your team. So now I've got a team of people around me who love what they do. Diana loves the social media aspect of it. Bill's a fantastic publicist. Um, Sandra is an amazing graphic designer. I don't, I, don't, like, I don't even understand how my website works anymore. I have no clue how WordPress <laughs> works anymore, and I'm happy. I like yeah. it that way. Sandra's yeah. got it, and I know she's got it. And if I say, hey, can you do this? She says, yes, and it's done. And I don't care about the details. I care about the outcome. And that yeah. makes it, it works a lot better that way. I mean, that, that really is a big part of it, I think, is with the challenge, the re one of the reasons why delegation is so challenging. We kind of already covered one of them is like you're used to being the one that does it. You know, you think you can do it better. And at least initially that, that may be true. But there's also that concern of loss of control. And I think there is that feel of, you know, I'm, I'm responsible for this outcome, but I don't understand all the outcomes. And I know I've... I've had discussions with people before where you, the way to kind of do that unlock is to just like imagine maybe not your first promotion to manager, but like the third or fourth or fifth is you like imagine, imagine yourself getting promoted to CEO and you are now responsible for everything that happens at the company, but you have absolutely no clue about what's going on like at the, at the bottom level, really. Like there's, there's just no way possible that you could do all that stuff. Um, how, I don't know, how do you, you, you were able to do it. You were able to, you know, kind of say like, okay, I'm going to focus on my things and shift, shift everything else away. If, if there's a manager out there listening and, the, and they're realizing this is their challenge, like what, what can we do to help them? The first thing I would say is that it's normal to, to hang on. You know, when, when you move from an individual contributor role to a manager role, there's some grieving. That's, that's a change process. And, and change equals yeah. change entails some grieving. And so hanging on to what we knew is normal. 
So recognizing that that's okay, you know, for a little while, that's okay. And, and you're going to have to get through it, but don't beat yourself up because you're naturally wanting to gravitate to back to what you know or what you knew. I think you have to take a leap of faith. Um, and, and so, for example, in my case, I didn't want to hand over the website to, to Sandra, but I got to a point where I was making so many mistakes with it and it was just driving me nuts. I'm like, I need some relief. Yeah. And Sandra said, yeah, I can do that. Sure. And so rather than saying, okay, I want you to update the website and this is how I want you to do it, I just said, this is what good looks like. This is what I want, the outcome. I don't care how the sausage is made. Just you know, come to me in three days with what I ask you for. And she knocked it out of the park consistently. Nice. And there's no mind reading involved. It, it helps that she's very seasoned. But there's no mind reading involved. It's mostly me getting out of the way and getting out of her business. And mm-hmm. so if you can have it, a, a big part of it is, is doing a little change management on yourself and recognizing that you're going to go through denial, resistance, exploration, and commitment. And denial and resistance are un, unpleasant, but a normal part of the process. And just kind of keep coaching yourself toward, okay, well, what, what could this look like? And then finally, mm-hmm. okay, I'm on board. And Sandra's running the website, and I don't even care how she does it. One question that I loved in there that you asked that you just mentioned is like, what could this look like? I feel like that's a big one is just, especially if you're in an organization where there are a lot of other new managers who haven't received training, and maybe you've never had the privilege as you did of having a really great example of what good leadership looks like. I think there's probably a lot of people who just their model of being a manager is being stressed out, being really controlled, being pulled in too many directions, not knowing what to do. And there is, I always go back to the, uh, Tim Ferriss has a question that he always says, he started asking himself of just, what if this were easy? Like, what if being a manager were easy? What would it possibly look like? And as pie Mm -hmm. in the sky as that might sound, it feels like it could be a good exercise for some people to just like, what would, what what else, how else could this work? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Another question that I love to ask when somebody comes to me asking for something is what would you do if I wasn't here? Mm. So, so an employee comes and asks a question and it's within their purview to know this. You know that they're smart and experienced and you just say, well, what would you do if I wasn't here? And let them, let them think about it and answer you. And chances are they'll come up with a good answer. And so if you can build that confidence and capability in your team that they actually know what they're doing and that you're there and you have their back, then you're going to develop a high performing team that, that does not rely on you for everything. hundred percent. That, that really reminds me of, I remember after I changed companies a while back, I, I ran into uh, someone who had left the same company that I had left and joined the same company that I had joined. And I ran into them again and they were talking about how after they had left their team had kind of immediately fallen apart. Uh, and they were kind of talking about it with a point of pride of like, they were the key, they were the linchpin, they were the one holding it together. And, um, you know, again, to, to bring up a Tim Ferriss thing, he would say, if, if, if you can't leave your team for, for two weeks and have nothing skip a beat, then you are doing a disservice to your team. Absolutely. That's really the goal. You've missed something big. If your team falls apart, if you're not there, yes, you, you yeah. want to build you want to build self reliance and capability, and have them have that mindset of I do know what I'm doing. I don't have to run to Matt for everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a great there's a great article in the Harvard Business Review called "Who's Got the Monkey," and it was written in '74 and then republished in the '90s, I think. And it talks about six different levels of decision making, everywhere from you wait to be told what to do all the way up to you just do whatever it is and don't even bother telling your boss. And the thesis that I, that I pull from that is let's at least get to level two where, you know, if I've, if I've got a question or a a problem, I come to Matt, my boss, not with a question, but with two or three options of how we might fix this. And so the discussion is not, what do I do? The discussion is I've done some thinking and I have two or three options for you. Which one do you like? Yeah. And yeah. And I mean, I think to the point that you keep making about realizing that this is a shift, this is another one of those shifts of going from individual contributor to manager 
in many ways as an individual contributor, like a big part of what you were trying to do is make yourself like the critical person. Like you're trying to get enough skills, get, you know, get to this point where you are the one that has the technical answer that is needed. And part of that shift when you become a manager is just, that's not the game anymore. It really is. It really is a different thing. Out, Outside of what individuals can do and what they can focus on, are there any common things that you see from the organizational perspective? Uh, if I'm, you know, I'm in HR and I'm thinking about policies, or I'm a director or or, or the head of a company, um, are there things an organization can do other than providing training and resources that can help this transition be easier? I think providing resources to high potentials. Um, so rather than sort of surprising somebody with, ta-da, you're a manager today, mm. letting people know that they're being observed, groomed, watched, and providing some resources ahead of time. So that's, that would be my ideal audience for the book and for the classes I teach is yeah. you know, a room full of high potentials who are going to be promoted within the next three months. So they get a realistic job preview of what being a manager actually entails. And they have the chance to say, okay, now I'm, now I'm ready. Or they may yeah. say, I'm tapping out. I, this is not for me. I want to, I want to follow the individual contributor path. And many organizations, especially larger ones have senior technical level ladders that people can follow. So you yeah. can become a vice president equivalent and still remain an individual contributor, you know, with all yeah. the rights and privileges thereof without having to manage a huge team. So yeah, People should know about that, you know, and not feel like their only path to advancement is to manage people because it's not for everybody. Yeah. But I think I think just an organization that says, hey, you know what, you're you're being you're being groomed and here are some resources and let's get you ready to make that transition so that you're not on a back foot already. Yeah. That would be that would be the thing I would really like to see more of because I tend to come in after somebody has been enrolled for a while. I'll, uh, I'll come into an organization where I've got a mix of brand new managers who have been enrolled for a month, and then I've got some folks who have been in for 10 years. And so with that vast range of experience, you have to juggle a little bit and say, okay, to these, to these people I'm going to say this, to these people I'm going to say that, and hopefully I'm hitting everybody's pain points. But if I could get a cohort of brand new, just about to be promoted folks, oh, yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, And also – maybe not even about to be promoted, but people who could be promoted, that idea of there should be people, there will be people who say, this isn't for me, mm -hmm. right? Once they learn about it, they're going to say like, eh. And uh, I mean, talk about a progressive company. If, if I see a company that has that, like one, having those dual tracks so people know that they can get promoted in different ways. Um, but then even after that, giving people a preview so that they can kind of try before they buy. Um, I imagine would be really, really helpful for an organization. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, my book would be one of those resources I would offer. There are tons of others. Yeah. Do a little reading, Do spend a little time on YouTube before you get promoted to, to decide if this is even for you. And if it is, then you're ready to go. And then you can step into role confidently without trying to figure it out on day one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so the book just came out, Lead Like a Pro. Um, what's, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that's just like a key nugget from the book that you want to make sure people walk away with? I think the, you know, it's on the last page. Um, there is the, there is nice. the, um, the, in big bold letters, it says, you are not alone. As a, as a new manager, it can feel overwhelming. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to think about. I would encourage folks to remember that they're surrounded by their network and they need to, to broaden that network and talk to people who are the more seasoned than them, more experienced than them, make friends with your HRBP, make friends with senior leaders in other organizations aside from your own and, you know, build that network of leaders that you can go to, you know, so you've got a best friend or two or three at work you can go to and say, Hey, I'm having this challenge. Um, I have personally really benefited from my relationships with HRBPs and uh, talking with other senior leaders. I mean, just networking and getting to know people and letting them get to know you so that when you need a hand, you've, you've got that ready to go is really helpful. Awesome. Well, 
Thank you so much for that, Eric. Thank you for your time. The book is Lead Like a Pro. Everybody, make sure you go pick it up. It's on Amazon. Um, like I said, I, I just really, really highly recommend this book. You, you did some. I know it was, I know it was difficult. <laughs> I know you've shared that the, the creation of this book was a challenge. Uh, it was well worth the effort. It's really good stuff. So thank you so much for being here, Eric. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you liked the discussion, make sure to hit like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. As a reminder, if your team is struggling keeping up with the training development demands of your organization, we want to help. Better Everyday Studios is a full service instructional design team that can help you with everything from ideation to actual content creation and delivery. Please reach out to us using the link in the episode notes below. Have a great day.